Welcome back to the Nerdbone Channel. Today, I'm going to talk about star trackers and everything you need to know to prevent forest fires using a star tracker. No, I'm just kidding. Basically, this is going to be everything you need to know about star trackers from amateur all the way to the guys who are pretty advanced. So if you're advanced, maybe skip halfway through the video. Don't worry, my feelings will not be hurt. It actually probably helps the algorithm. But anyways, let's get into it. So, one of the first pieces of advice and the very first step you should take if you're getting into astrophotography and you want to start is not to buy a star tracker actually, it's to buy a tripod, okay? Because you're going to need this, okay? Now, what kind of tripod should you get? This is an aluminum one. This has been my beater boy for a long time. I've, I think I've had this for 16 years now. You should definitely make sure that it has a 3 8 inch screw on the top of it, okay? Because that's what your tracker is going to need to screw into. Now, the trackers do, at least mine did, my Skywatcher Adventure Pro did come with an adopter to use a quarter inch, but you know, the 3 8 inch is more desirable. Now, whether or not you should get a tall tripod or a short tripod kind of depends on your preferences. I like a tall tripod for if there's no wind, okay? If there's no wind, I like a tall tripod because it just makes polar alignment easy, okay? And I don't like making astrophotography hard. I don't think you do either. Now, aluminum ones are heavy. They won't blow over, okay? They're also cheap, okay? You can get one of these for like 60 bucks on eBay because, you know, there's been this mass exodus amongst photographers. Everybody's deserting their tripod and just going handheld. But astrophotography, sorry folks, you can't handhold that. <laughs> now, there's carbon fiber tripods out there and those are pretty nice for traveling so if you were going to do traveling and when you do astrophotography you know you're going to the parks or something like that well then in that case a carbon fiber tripod would be an excellent idea also if wind is a concern just set the thing lower to the ground or maybe hang your bag off of it to basically give it some weight so why do you want to start with a tracker okay there are actually some telescope mounts out there that can track the sky that are cheaper than one of these are however i'll tell you right now if you're just getting into this using one of those telescope tri tripods you're going to have to do some jury rigging to get your camera attached to it and that might just be a little bit more technical technicalities than maybe somebody who's just getting into this hobby would want to do so these things, yes, they cost a little bit more, but they're very versatile, okay? And they're also very scalable. You can buy a basic kit. This right here is just the head. This is the most simple version that you can buy. And you can add components to it later as you grow and you want to improve the hobby, all right? And on top of that, they're very portable, okay? You can really scale this thing down and stick this thing into a camera bag and take it with you. I know I've taken this thing to a couple locations. I took this to Colorado with me. I've taken it to Florida. Yeah, and it fits in a carry-on bag along with my camera gear because I'm an Olympus guy, you know, I, I have smaller gear. <laughs> The first thing you're going to want to be able to do in conjunction with your tripod is be able to mount this and basically get it polar lined. Now, if you bought a tripod that has a ball head, all right, you might not want to try using this. This is just going to be a pain in the butt. However, you can do it this way, basically. It's just you're not going to be able to get a very good solid polar alignment. I would suggest when you do pick up a tripod, get one with a video head, okay? Most of the time, you're not going to want to cock the head anyways if you're doing landscape type, landscape type astrophotography in the first place, you know, which is what you're probably going to start out doing when you begin. The very next thing that you really ought to upgrade is switching out your video panning head with one of these. This is actually what they call a wedge, all right? And it's from Skywatcher, it's, it's for this guy right here. There's other ones out there made by other brands, there's William Optics, there's Ioptron. But the beauty of one of these is that it's going to allow you to basically do a much, much better polar alignment, okay? Because it's got these little knobs right here and also the one in the front that basically allows you to do the tilting and the panning to basically get it nice and centered. And then this thing's going to go right in here like so. And this is actually a, one of the most advised upgrades, I think. It's a more advised thing over a counterweight. Speaking of. All right, so this guy usually comes with, with every single tracker that Skywatcher makes, at least. And it slips in place like so. Camera goes up here. There's actually a micro knob right here that allows it to rotate the head. 
And I love that feature right there. I, I wish some of the other ones out there had that feature. The iOptron does not have that. And then mine actually did not come with a counterweight, this right here. This is going to allow you to put a lot more weight on this guy. And it's also gonna give you a little bit better tracking, you know, because basically now you can, the gears will be at net zero. There won't be like pushing a lot of weight anymore. And that guy is just gonna screw in here like so. One of the other things that's a bit of a pain with this particular model, but it's something you need to be concerned about is your batteries. Most of them have either an internal battery that you charge or they're gonna use double A's. Now I use rechargeable ones and I just make sure that they are fully charged before I go anywhere with them. And they're, they're good all night. And you'll notice that I did have one that was not in here. And one of the reasons for that is with this particular model, it's very easy to actually accidentally turn this thing on and it will kill itself. And that means that when you get to your dark sky location, you will be like, crap, my batteries are dead, okay? However, there's another thing that I kind of like to do. This is a battery pack. It's got three USB ports on it. And one of the cool things about this model, and also many of the other models that are out there, is you can run a USB cord into this port right here and basically use this battery pack instead. And this guy will run for weeks on end, okay? And it'll also power up some of my dew heaters, which is something else you're probably gonna wanna add as you get more into this hobby. So here's something kind of cool, actually, that I just found. This is something that I found on Thingiverse and I 3D printed it. Basically what it does is it's going to glue over the knob, basically, and basically form a, a bit of protection, but I can still, with my fingers, get in there and turn this thing so this thing won't get accidentally knocked around. Uh, and this is something I'm gonna stick on here and use the next time I go out. So I will put a link for this in the description down below. <laughs> All right, so. This right here is a little plug that comes that protects the polar scope, the front lens element. And when you put this in here, okay, your Skywatcher Adventure Pro is going to come with a basically a little illuminator that would have stuck in there. Now, there's a little three prong rubber adopter, which I didn't even know the thing was. I threw it out because I didn't know what it was. <sighs> Dumb of me, I know. but. You need that for when you have this guy attached because once you have this guy attached, you can't use the original, the original, you can't use this guy just as it is. However, I found this guy, this is something I found on Thingiverse again, another little improvement that you can make to it. And I gotta say, this is even better than what comes with the factory item, okay? So it basically, you 3D print it, and then you stick this guy in here like so. It's actually pretty solid. That lets me put it back in there. There we go, all right. <laughs> and it goes into the hole like so, and I like this a lot better than what originally came with it. So I guess I don't miss it that much. Now, this is where we start doing some more advanced stuff where we start tuning this thing to kind of make it better, all right? Now, this knob right here is what kind of turns the head up and down basically to get you polar aligned. And from the factory, it's gonna have an enormous amount of backlash, okay? Backlash is where you're turning it one direction, you go too far, so you gotta turn around and go back the other way, but there's this bit of slack in the knob that has to be taken up before it actually re-engages the gears and starts moving the thing. You know, machinists, we, we, know, we use this term all the time. So, Right in here, there's actually this steel sleeve with slotted indentations. And basically this right here is what you would tighten in order to kind of get rid of some of that backwash. Now you can't tighten it too much because it'll lock this thing up, but you can actually get rid of a lot of backlash, which will make polar lining an easier pastime. And the easier something is, the more you're going to put finesse into it, which is going to get you a better polar alignment and also make the hobby more fun. Who doesn't want that? These two knobs right here, which basically pan the head, okay? And they were just getting a ton of backlash in them. And today, actually, I wish I'd done this earlier, I took the thing apart, okay? You basically take out these two Allen screws here. And this steel knob basically is screwed in here with a Phillips screw, and it was just loose, okay? So if yours has a lot of backlash, check that and tighten it down. It will make panning the head a little more fun. One of the other things you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to want 
to sight in your polar scope, okay? These scopes, they have actually a movable radical in there, which does need to be sighted in. And basically it's gonna have a central set of crosshairs. And when you spin this head, that central point should not move around, right? And it's pretty simple. I mean, you can do this in the daytime. Actually, I recommend you do this in the daytime. You just go out, maybe sight at somebody's chimney or a telephone pole that's a long distance away. And there's these three very small Allen keys around the base of the polar scope. And you just rotate this thing around and just make your adjustments accordingly until you get that reticle centered up so that it doesn't wobble around because you want it centered along the axis of the actual tracker. Now the newer Wi-Fi versions have an app that you can basically connect to this thing and you can control it and even do guiding. Also this thing can actually trigger your camera. This right here is basically a cable that would go into the ball port of my camera and you can set up a sequence basically through the Wi-Fi app and do a very cool set of sequences and you won't have to carry an intervalometer into the field with you, all right? Now this cable right here is actually an intervalometer which will control the camera. And the beauty of this is that even if you're not getting into guiding, which this right up here is a guide scope, even if you're not doing that, this thing can basically sync the sequence of the camera and the movements of the head and actually do a dither in one of the axes. Now you really do need two axes to dither. So one of the things that I recommend that you do is you know just set a timer in your phone and if you're there like stop the camera sequence okay and this knob right here I just basically take it and I turn it and then I turn it back to where it was and that will basically give you enough movement in the pixels of the sensor on the sky that you will have a dither on both axes, which will dramatically, dramatically reduce the amount of pattern noise in your images when you start stacking them together. <laughs> now, by the way, if you do decide to go down to the deep trail of guiding with one of these things, I recommend if you get one of these flash shoe adopters that go to a quarter 20, make sure it's a metal one, all right? And another way to do it though is actually to get one of those Arca Swiss brackets that come up the side of the camera and basically get an adopter that mounts it along the side. It'll be a little bit off centered in weight and everything, but it'll work pretty good, okay? And that will be a stiffer way of doing it. Another thing that I recommend is that the cords that come down off this thing, make sure those, short, those cords are short and that they're not long so that if they're hanging way down, you know, now of course they do need enough movement they do need enough length to like, move to make all the moves that they're going to make throughout the night. But the longer they are, the heavier they're going to be, and the more that's going to basically bend this thing, and you don't want that. A wide field tracker like this is something that every astrophotographer should have, no matter how advanced you are in the hobby. It's still fun sometimes to go back and do just a wide field panorama of some sections of sky. I know I have had a lot of fun with mine and I continue to use it. I'm actually really thinking about upgrading to one of the newer versions of these because it has the Wi-Fi built into it, which will allow me to do a lot more stuff with my camera and gear. But that will come with time. And really, whatever equipment you get, you know, it really doesn't matter as long as you have fun. And one of the reasons why I started this channel was to kind of get people into this hobby because there weren't very many people using Olympus gear that were doing astrophotography. And if you're using an Olympus camera, by the way, check out the built-in intervalometer that is in every Olympus camera. Also, I've got a lot of other videos about the topic and using Olympus gear. Also, Olympus cameras come with these handy little clips that go on the, uh, the neck strap of your camera and it basically kind of gives you a cable organizer, which you know prevents cables from getting jerked out of your camera should you decide to control the camera from a laptop or maybe keep it powered from an external battery pack, kind of like this guy right here. All right. Take care, folks, and thank you.